And good afternoon, everyone. Thank you for joining us. We are just connecting our feeds and we will get started momentarily. Thank you for joining us. And we are all connected. So, good afternoon, everyone, and welcome. My name is Sophia Nathlawi, Author Events Coordinator here at the Enoch Pratt Free Library. Thank you for joining us for the March edition of Lunch and Learn, A Taste of Maryland and The Great Recipe Hunt, in partnership with the Maryland State Archives and the Maryland Four Centuries Project. And so now, without further ado, I'm going to turn it over to Bert to introduce today's speaker. Thank you, Sophia, and welcome everyone to our third Lunch and Learn Lecture of 2023. Along with my usual thank you to our partners, the Maryland State Archives and the Enoch Pratt Free Library, I want to give a big shout out and a special thank you to Sophia Nolawi, who has been the Pratt's Command Central for all of our talks during much of the pandemic. Thank you so much, Sophia. You will be missed. As a representative of the Maryland's Four Centuries Project, I want to draw your attention to our Maryland Monday Firsts on Facebook and Instagram. Since the beginning of this year, as we create a collection of Maryland Firsts throughout the state's history, we are posting people, places, events, objects, documents, and buildings on social media that show how important Maryland has been to the development of the nation. We are looking forward to completing a statewide collection for Maryland's role in the upcoming U.S. 250th anniversary in 2026. Today's lecture certainly demonstrates how our state has played an important role in U.S. history. There are few topics more engaging to all of us than foodways. And today we are lucky to have one of the experts on Maryland's foodways to open a big door to that subject. Beyond the crabs and the oysters from the Chesapeake Bay's memorable bounty, I began to understand how diverse and interesting food heritage is when I lived and worked in Southern Maryland. Enjoying church suppers in St. Mary's City, I ran into a 1980 book of favorite recipes from the Trinity Episcopal Church in Maryland's first capital. With over 230 pages of hometown recipes, I discovered a whole new history of culinary delights. The special discovery of stuffed ham has been the highlight for many Southern Maryland cooks, and I even tried my hand at a couple of stuffed hams with pretty good success. Joyce White, Today's speaker has searched for these discoveries throughout Maryland. She is currently focused on the traditional 1963 cookbook, Maryland's Way, from the iconic Annapolis Hammond Harwood House. Joyce is updating that effort with an anniversary edition. I can't think of anyone more qualified to uh, present four centuries of Maryland's foodways, and Joyce has paid her dues as a real expert on open, open hearth cooking and preparing meals with the difficult methods of our ancestors, she's gotten her hands dirty and she's wiped away sweat to produce memorable results. Updating the new edition of the cherished Hammond Harwood cookbook, Joyce is also searching out the diversity that many generations of immigrants have brought to our tables. And most importantly, she is showcasing the major influence that African-American cooks have had preparing meals in Maryland, households throughout our history. I'm excited to learn about Maryland's way in the kitchen, and I know that you will be as well. Please welcome Joyce White. Thank you, Bert. Um, I just wanna say I'm thrilled to be here today, and I'm going to be talking primarily about the great Maryland recipe hunt today and um, all of the uh, in inspirations for that and where it's taken us to this point. So I'm just gonna take a second here to share my screen, hopefully without any problems. 
and here we go. So this project is uh, sponsored in part by the Maryland State Archives and the Hammond Harwood House, which um, I am the vice president of Hammond Harwood House Museum. So it's sort of a perfect opportunity for me to uh, look, take another look at uh, the book to honor that book. Um, there are a couple of reasons why we're doing this. So um, way back before uh, our, all of our lives were disrupted in 2020, um, Maria Day, who is one of the senior archivists at the Maryland State Archives, and I sort of hatched this plan to collect and preserve Maryland's food traditions so that uh, the archive of, of those food traditions at the Maryland State Archives could be enlarged and also could reflect more diversity that's been um, so important in the development of Maryland's cuisine. And so we had planned to basically host an open day at the archives and at possibly other sites like the Maryland Historical Society and other historical associations to try to get people to come and bring their traditions, um, not just the recipes, uh, but the actual stories behind those traditions. You know, why we uh, serve the foods that we do. Where did we get these recipes? Who in our family passed it down to us? Um, all those um, um, aspects of our food traditions that you're not necessarily gonna find in just a recipe in and of itself, right? So that backstory is what's really important as well. So we, you know, we're like, okay, we're gonna we're gonna plan this for October of 2019, and then um, we had to postpone it because of a conflict at the archives, and so then um, we said, well, let's do it in the spring of 2020. Well, you all know what happened then, so we could not do that. Um, so once things started to open up, uh, I met with Maria again. I guess it was in uh, 20 end of 2021. And we started to talk about this idea again. We neither of us had uh, forgotten about it. We wanted to revive it. Um, now that I was the you know vice president of Hammond Harvard House, we thought you know uh, the 60th anniversary of the publication of Maryland's Way, the Hammond Harvard House Cookbook, is coming up in 2023, um, and that is um, a wonderful collection of recipes that were donated by people from across the street, uh, state in the 50s, but also it was um, fill, it's filled with um, historic handwritten recipes from journals, manuscript receipt books, um, and newspapers, and, uh, and a variety of sources, and, as well as letters, um, going back hundreds of years. So we thought, well, wouldn't it be a good idea to maybe do another recipe collection uh, to honor that type of collecting that went on in the 50s to create this book. And so uh, the idea was hatched. And um, uh, the women who, I just want to talk a little bit about the history of the Maryland's Way cookbook as well, because I find that really fascinating. Um, it was uh, devised by two women who had been on sort of the board at the time, the Hammond Harvard House Association, Frances uh, Kelly, who lived in Anne Arundel County uh, as well, they both did, and Hope Andrews of Tulip Hill Estate. But one of the things that you find out when you do more research into the book is that many of the recipes were tested by Hope Andrews, African-American cook um, at Tulip Hill. And she's really given credit for it. Every once in a while, you'll see a recipe will say uh, Miss Alice Ways or Alice Brown's Ways, uh, a way of doing it. But other than that, you know, she's not really given credit. So we thought, you know, the diversity that's in that book is, um, it's apparent, but it's not acknowledged. So uh, a second project for me, which is, I'm not really gonna talk too much about today. It's really gonna focus mainly on the hunt itself, but is creating a companion book to the Maryland's Way cookbook that will actually do that. It will talk about three main uh, influences on uh, early Maryland's sort of the development of that cuisine. And that would be, you know, there's a British base, but then there's Native American, African-American, as well as German, uh, particularly Pennsylvania Dutch. So, um, so that's what that companion book is going to be about. And that won't be coming out till like 2024. Uh, that just takes a long time to do. Um, so back to the, the actual recipe hunt itself now. So as I said, the, the book, uh, they began testing recipes in the 1950s. They worked for at least five years. They created this, you know, cookbook of almost 700 recipes. And again, many of them were taken from 18th and 19th century primary source documents, but also was bolstered by 20th century recipes. 
Um, the thing that's really interesting about this book, again, when you kind of do research into the book itself, is that I found that in the first 20 years or so, from, so from the early 60s when it was first published to the early 80s, they had sold over 100,000 copies. And a copy of it had even been sent to Prince Charles and Princess Diana on the occasion of their marriage from a Marylander. So um, that I find really fascinating. But this new hunt today is uh, a hunt for a new generation. We're, we're, we're looking at trying to find uh, ways to kind of bridge the gap in the diversity uh, of Maryland's cuisine and also to see what's been coming in in the last 60 years since the cookbook was first published, but also to collect everything. Um, so we want this recipe hunt to yield a, a research depository so researchers can go to the Maryland State Archives where all of the information will be preserved and they will be able to see a huge collection of food history, recipes, again, as well as as many stories about these foods that we can collect as possible. And so these submissions will all be made uh, available to the general public. They're not yet, um, just because it's, it's a lot of information to collate and uh, to get over to the archives, but that it's forthcoming, I promise it will be there. Um, it's also going to be a, a depository of, of my research. And um, it's going to include uh, references to food from the 17th century onwards and, and possibly even going back to research that was done on uh, pre-contact um, indigenous uh, cultures through archeology span um, and as many uh, different sources as I can find. Um, but right now we're looking at things like those journals, those manuscript receipt books, letters, newspapers, um, probate inventories, memoirs of um, African-Americans who had been enslaved um, through um, in, in the 19th century, as well as through the Works Progress Administration's uh, slave narratives uh, and more. So it's going to be as comprehensive as we can make it and as large as the, <laughs> the archives is willing to accept. So, um, but of course, we're also looking for submissions from the general public. So instead of just doing one day, like Marie and I at the archives had decided back in 2019, we decided, well, why don't we just make this um, available to people for a whole year? So we started September 1st of 2022, and we are going through to the end of August of this year, 2023. So it'll be a full year. Um, we are looking for all recipes, um, old classics, you know, those traditional favorites, as well as uh, newer imports, um, recipes that have come with uh, new Marylanders, people from maybe other states uh, or maybe other countries even. So um, we want to find as, as much information about today's food as possible. Um, I think the thing that we forget is we sort of take our food traditions for granted. Like we know what uh, what we eat, where, where we eat it, the, you know, sort of the occasions for which we eat it. Um, but in 100 years, 200 years, you know, that might not be as obvious to people. So it's really good to, to document the biggest picture possible and to give as much information as possible. So now I'm going to just look at the nuts and bolts of how to submit a recipe. So you just go to this website, MarylandRecipes.org. It's very simple to use. And um, you can, you know, there's different information about the hunt, there's recipes, there's videos, lots of information, but you basically click on where it says submit recipe. So I'll go back here, you can see it up in the center on the top part of that bar. So you click submit recipe and this page will come up and you're only seeing uh, part of that page. And um, every field with an asterisk is a field you need to complete. So, you know, just the basics name, email, and by the way, your email will be kept private. It will not be available for researchers to see. Uh, your, but your name will, um, but your email won't. Um, and then of course the name of your food or drink and questions like where did this come from? What's, you know, what part of Maryland? Um, and then you're also going to have to give us permission, right? You have to give the, the Maryland State Archives permission to house the material, to share it. So, because my program for creating the, this, the um, 
website does not uh, allow me to do check boxes. You just have to type yes to I understand all information images submitted will become the property of Hammond Harvard House Museum and the Maryland State Archives. And then I understand information images submitted will be made available to the public and may be shared with the public. But again, not your personal contact details. Um, also, I just wanted to bring your attention to the fact that we, uh, the Hunt also has a Facebook page. So uh, we would welcome you to all go on there and like it. Um, every week I'll post some themes just to help jog your memory about certain foods, but that doesn't mean you can only post about that type of food during the week. Um, it just, it's just there to create a conversation and help you, um, you know, start thinking about those traditions. So now what I'm going to do is give you a look at a, a taste of Maryland um, through some of the submissions that the recipe hunt has uncovered. So this is not my normal taste of Maryland presentation. So we're doing something a little bit different today, just so um, you can see um, the kinds of responses that we've been getting and you know, see the spectrum of uh, generations of different types of, of recipes and those stories behind it. So we're going to start with oysters because, of course, you know, everybody associates um, Maryland with oysters. Um, historically, the Chesapeake Bay has had ideal conditions for oysters. Not so much now, but historically. Um, the, the shallow waters, right, the majority of the, the bay is less than six feet, um, uh, you know, makes it a perfect environment. There's a lot of nutrients in um, the, the grasses and uh, there are very firm bottom conditions, again, making it possible for those oysters to, uh, to, to survive. Uh, and also the forest covered lands uh, re has in the past reduced erosion so that there wasn't a collection of silt that would clog the gills of the oysters. So again, all that has changed. We're, again, we're not gonna talk about um, how that's changed, um, but we're gonna talk about how oysters have um, impacted people in Maryland from on a social as well as a culinary um, basis. So this is a hunt submission that was received by Margaret Radford from Anne Arundel County. And it's her memory of an oyster roast. And she writes, we always had an oyster roast on Thanksgiving day and many other times over the winter when oysters are in season. You make a wood fire and put a grate over it, put big pieces of burlap in a bucket of water near the fire pit, put the oysters on the grate, Ring out the burlap and spread it over the oysters. The oysters will open as they cook from the fire below and from the steam on top from the burlap. They get a lot of smoky flavor and they're really delicious. I didn't care for oysters when I was very young, but when I was a teenager, I decided I'd learn to like, to like them because the adults were having so much fun around that fire. So again, it's not just about the food itself, but it's about that um, social occasion that accompanied um, the oysters. Of course, uh, the other uh, important uh, food coming out of the bay is Maryland blue crabs. Um, and this is a hunt submission for crab imperial that comes from Alice E.B. Smith of Dorchester County on the Eastern shore. She wrote, my mother, Nanette Trott Ber Berberick, prepared the dish on special occasions throughout my childhood for guests. Daddy and mother loved to entertain and play cards. Bridge was their favorite card game. This recipe was handed down to my mother by my great grandmother, Alice McGuire Evans, who lived with my maternal grandparents and mother and her siblings. Mama, as my great mom, uh, grandmother was called, did all of the cooking. So again, there's the recipe, but then there's the story. And she went ahead and gave us some pictures as well. So there's her mother and, and herself. So again, this tradition, which has uh, passed down the generations is so important. Um, I think we forget that um, those are folk traditions and, and what happens with folk traditions is that we, um, we observe the foods being made. Sometimes are, these recipes are not even written down, right? You just learn by observing. Then you repeat what you see, but sometimes you may vary what you uh, are doing because you need to adapt it to maybe dietary needs of your family members, or you're just modernizing it, whether you're making something gluten-free or um, you know, just maybe cutting down on sodium or fat or whatever you know, those issues are, or maybe you just can't get certain ingredients anymore. Uh, you know, you're changing the tradition, but 
that doesn't mean the tradition is dying. That means it's it's lasting because you're keeping it alive, even though you're changing it. If you don't change it, um, then it will die because you will just completely stop making it if it no longer meets your needs. So these traditions change over time. And that's one of the, the goals of the hunt too, is to see how some of these um, recipes may have changed over time. Um, I wanna talk now uh, about one of the uh, a, a collection of recipes that I'm particularly pleased to have found um, through the recipe hunt. And it uh, is a, actually, it's a collection of recipes in a, a cook booklet that was published by the Nanticoke Historic Preservation Alliance. Um, it's called Recipes Inspired by Native American Culture Adapted for Modern Methods of Cooking. Again, right there, uh, you see how you're taking Native recipes, but um, presenting them in a way that works for people today, rather than just letting them die away. Um, and this was a cookbook really just uh, produced for that Nanticoke uh, Alliance, Historic Preservation Alliance. So the fact that this was shared with the recipe hunt is um, just thrilling for me. And the recipe I've chosen to share with you from the book today, or at least talk, talk about, um, is one for venison and wild mushroom stew. So uh, when you do research into Maryland's first people, you find that apart from the oysters um, and, and, and some wild uh, plants that were consumed, and of course the agriculture that began in the um, about 700 AD in, in Maryland uh, with corn, beans, and squash, the, the single most important food that was consumed among uh, Maryland's indigenous people was venison. And so to have this recipe published in 2013 is a direct link back to, you know, probably thousands of years of, of cooking, of, of eating amongst uh, Maryland's native people. So, um, you know, just again, thrilling to have this. We're looking for more Native American recipes. So if any of you out there are, are Native American or no people, no tribal members, please, please encourage them to submit. Um, here's one also that's related to Native American foods, it's not necessarily coming from a Native American. I don't know who, you know, this person's uh, background, even though I do encourage uh, people to write uh, or to, to answer a question about the cultural tradition from which it comes. Um, so this is a recipe for succotash, which is a classic uh, Native uh, dish made of green corn, meaning the, the fresh corn um, that's in season uh, rather than the starchy cured dried corn. And uh, of course, mixed with beans, which uh, lima beans were one of the more popular types that were grown by Native Americans. Um, but this one was uh, submitted by Jan Ritchie of um, her family's from Hebron and Wicomico County on the Eastern Shore. She now lives in Australia. So she found out about the recipe hunt all the way out in, in Australia, which is you just know, just amazing. Um, she writes, my grandmother owned a hotel in Ocean City, so we had summers there every year. Beach, boardwalk, and crabbing are great memories. I remember shelling lima beans and shucking corn on the front porch of my great aunt's place in Hebron about 1957. Real rich chicken stock was used from a pot on the stove, probably started after breakfast. This was the liquor used to boil the, the limas and the corn scraped from the cobs. Add plenty of salt and pepper, serve with small dishes as a side dish to chicken and dumplings for dinner. If I helped, then I was allowed to play with the wild kittens in the barn. So again, just, you know, food can evoke such incredible memories of, of our past. And um, really those memories should not be forgotten. Now I wanna talk about uh, Maryland diamondback terrapin, of course, our state reptile. Um, diamondback terrapin, um, a species of turtle, um, is one of the most popular um, turtles that was consumed by Native Americans and settlers and African Americans who were here um, in those early years. But it, it wasn't the only one. They were consuming box turtles, snapping turtle, any kind of turtle they could get, they ate. Um, uh, this They're perfect, the diamondback Terrapin, of course, was the, one of the prized ones for its flavor, um, inhabits salt marshes. Um, and of course, the Chesapeake colonists ate terrapin. Um, 
they followed the Native American tradition of roasting it whole in live coals. Uh, but also um, Europeans were eating turtle in soups and stews, uh, particularly uh, the type of stew that developed in Maryland was what really just became called Maryland terrapin. And it was a, a thick cream-based stew with uh, a lacing of usually of sherry, which might sound similar to um, cream of crab, soup or even oyster soup. So they're all very similar. Um, and here's just an advertisement for turtle soup that was being served at um, St. Alden's uh, Baltimore Tavern on uh, Water Street. So for some reason in Baltimore in the late 19th century, Water Street was the place to get turtle. Um, so you can find lots of different advertisements for different establishments on the Water Street area for turtle. Um, but this um, was this submission was um, given to me by Henry Ward, who is actually uh, helping to organize the recipe hunt. He's a really interesting um, uh, person to know. I've, it's been uh, great to get to know him. He's an archaeologist, anthropologist, and he works with many of the local Native American tribes. And uh, because you know, in his spare time, he also became a chef, a trained professional chef. So he creates these lavish, um, you know, historic based Native American meals with tribes. Um, so it's a great uh, blending of his skills and their knowledge. And um, so he wrote about Terrapin in his in growing up here in Maryland, in um, the Cecil County area. Many of my fondest food memories growing up was cooking with my grandmothers. The memories of my mother's mother are the strongest, including helping her clean turtles to make cream terrapin, which was my grandfather's favorite. Cleaning the meat out of a turtle is no mean feat because they have lots of bones and cartilage. One had to be very careful to extract all of the edible meat. And I remember feeling proud at being considered old and skillful enough to help. The lean meat was sauteed in butter and then mixed into a creamy white sauce garnished with hard boiled eggs and flavored with a splash of sherry. We still had a terrapin in the freezer, at least a decade old, when we finally sold the house on the Elk River. Rather than throwing it out, I gifted, to an gifted it to an archeologist friend who defleshed the bone shell and added it to his funnel identification collection. Always got a kick that my grandfather's last hurdle ended up advancing scientific research. So again, you, you just never know what you're going to get. And this is, is just a really, really detailed description of how to clean that turtle, which you don't always find in um, a lot of the recipes. Now I want to talk about Indian corn, which is um, sort of the mainstay of the early settlers' diets, as well as the um, enslaved African Americans who worked in Maryland's um, fields and the plantations. Um, corn was the, the chosen cereal crop as opposed to wheat because corn was much easier to plant. So one man could you know, grow enough corn by himself to feed himself and or a family for a year. Uh, many reasons for that. One, um, in the very, er very early days of settlement when the, the you know, forest had to be cleared, um, to grow corn, you do not need to remove the trees. You just need to girdle them so that they die and the leaves no longer uh, bloom so the sun can get down to the, the soil level. And um, you just plant the um, corn in clusters in hills. Um, uh, it's wind pollinated, so it's uh, different from wheat that uh, needs to be planted in rows and you do need to clear the fields of, of all the trees. Um, I'm not going to go into too much detail about wind pollination, but suffice it to say, it's better to plant in clusters so all of the um, silks get pollinated and um, each silk that therefore then grows a kernel on a cob. So you want as many of those silks to be um, harvested as possible. Um, the other reason corn was important uh, as a cereal crop is because it didn't compete with the tobacco at harvest time um, or really any other time. Um, once you planted the corn, you just uh, had, to, had to do some weeding in the initial um, you know, weeks, but then once the, the corn started to grow, it sort of um, took care of itself. Um, but once it was ready for harvest um, or once it matured, you didn't have to harvest it right away. And that was good because it, that usually occurred at the same time as the tobacco um, harvest. So once you got your tobacco harvest in, which was essentially the more important one because it was the, the cash one, right? It was the one you used uh, to buy things with. 
um, your, your corn, you know, it just hung out in the fields and it matured and those sugars continued to turn into starches and it dried so that once it was, once you were able to harvest it, it was ready to be stored um, as a dried product. So it would last for the winter. Um, so we received a recipe for a quick corn pone from a person named Billy Gray from Worcester County writes, uh, my mother learned this recipe when she was in high school, which would have been about 1935. She watched her aunt make the recipe and took notes to create a recipe with measurements. Again, because many of those early recipes do not include any uh, details, right? They might be a list of ingredients with no measurements at all, or maybe a few measurements um, or no directions. Um, they just assumed you knew what you were doing. And this was the, these recipes that were written down were just to jog your memory a little bit, but uh, you know, more people cooked than they do today. And so people were definitely more skilled or more people were, were, were skilled in the kitchen than probably there is today with our um, accessibility for prepared foods, restaurants, fast foods, that sort of thing. Uh, we don't have to have as many of these skills. Here's another corn recipe. This is Uncle Jerry's fried corn. So this recipe comes from uh, a series of recipes that I took from a cookbook by um, two churches from Sandy Spring, Maryland. So the Sharp Street United Methodist Church and the Sandy Spring Monthly Meeting. So the Sharp Street uh, was the um, African-American church or is the African-American church. It's changed its name now. And then the Sandy Spring Monthly Meeting is the Quaker um, church. There's a huge history of uh, Quakers in Sandy Spring, therefore African-Americans because the Quakers really um, were the first uh, and largest group in um, 18th century Maryland to free their enslaved and also to offer refuge for escaped um, slaves or freed slaves. So, uh, you know, a large community of African-Americans developed in that area. Um, so this recipe is in a cookbook that these two churches put together called Feast of Goodness. And the, um, the book itself was suggested to me for the hunt by the Sandy Spring Museum, of which then I got permission from these two uh, churches to include not the entire cookbook, but several of the recipes. And this is, um, by Octavia Hill Jeffries, who's uh, an African-American member of the Sharp Street Methodist United Methodist Church. And she wrote um, in her description of her food, which is a uh, reason I love this cookbook too, is because it includes these sort of backstories in, in, for some of the recipes. She writes, my great uncle Warwick, uh, Jerry Hill was a great cook. For years, I tried to make his fried corn and fried tomatoes with biscuits, but it didn't have the same taste. Talking with my mom, Margaret Hill, one day about it, she made me realize why it never tasted the same. She said, quote, it was the milk and cream from the cow, not the store. How right she was. I grew up on my great grandfather's Charles T. Hill's dairy farm on Norwood Road, milking cows, slopping pigs, riding horses, feeding chickens, duck and tur ducks and turkeys, and eating straight from Mama Sadie's grandmother's vegetable garden was normal. I also had a choice of fruit trees, plum, peach, and apple persimmon. So again, this idea that um, over time, the taste changed because the product itself has changed, right? We don't have that access to freshly milked um, products or freshly, a freshly milked cow anymore. Um, this one is also uh, pretty poignant from Calvert County by Val Meyer um, for fried chicken. Of course, Maryland is known as fried for its fried chicken. Um, actually, if you go to England, um, they have a chain of foods called Maryland fried chicken, <laughs> right? We have Kentucky fried chicken, which came, actually came from Maryland. Can, um, can, many of Kentucky's traditions came from um, people who lived in St. Mary's County, Maryland, who settled in Kentucky but they call it Maryland fried chicken. Um, but she writes, oh, I could talk about Graham's fried chicken all day. Her fried chicken smelled and tasted like home to so many. We grew up with our grandmother on our family tobacco farm in Southern Maryland, specifically known as Adelina Bowensville. My first memory of her cooking her fried chicken was seeing my grandfather and the paid field hands walking up out of the tobacco fields, midday hot and sweaty. They were both black and white working together, laughing and making jokes. They sat under Graham's big shade tree trees that had a bench 
um, that her father had built between two trees. She would bring out a big serving dish piled out with golden brown, warm, crispy fried chicken, and all the men, sometimes some women too, would take a couple of pieces, put them on a plate with a side of potato salad and white bread. Oh, and the mason jar full of ice water. They would all comment over and over again, Miss June, thank you, this chicken sure is good. I absolutely loved seeing them enjoy her chicken as much as I did. Plus, she always fried extra for our dinner that night. Sometimes we'd even eat it cold from the fridge the next day. That is if there was any left, which wasn't often. Her fried chicken brought people together across racial divides, age gaps, education levels. It was a special time and she was a special lady. I sure do miss her chicken and her. I hope her recipe will be enjoyed by many for generations to come. And that really just encapsulates the whole point of this, this hunt. Right? Um, another recipe was submitted by uh, a woman from Moncton, Sandra Patterson. Um, and she took her, she took, she submitted actually three recipes from a, a cookbook from St. James um, Academy, uh, part of the St. James Episcopal Church in Moncton. Um, again, it was a, a church that has a long history going back to 1750. And uh, one of the recipes, uh, squash casserole, was um, noted to be from a woman called Maudie Patterson, who was, she writes, was a pillar of the community and made this for lots of church and family events. As her relative, I enjoyed it many times at family reunions and often make it for my own family. Maudie was also head of the St. James Church Altar Guild for many years, and her daughter took her place and is still on the Altar Guild group with me currently in 2023. So again, this, this connecting to um, centuries ago, but also to just uh, you know former generations of families is a, way, a great way to uh, preserve your family's recipes. Sweet potatoes. Um, I want to talk a little bit about them because they were extremely important to the diets of many of Maryland's enslaved uh, people. Uh, cornmeal was the main ration, but sweet potatoes were one of the things that um, the African-American enslaved could grow on their own or were sometimes actually allowed to kind of plant together and, and divide up um, along with the, uh, the, the slaveholders family. Um, and this uh, quote is actually uh, some research that I found. It's uh, from Frederick Douglass. He writes, the old cabin with its rail floor and rail bedsteads upstairs and its clay fo floor downstairs and its dirt chimney and windowsless sides and that most curious piece of workmanship dug in front of the fireplace beneath with grandmammy placed the sweet potatoes to keep them from the frost was my home, the only home I ever had. And I loved it and all connected with it. So Frederick Douglass, when he was little, he was not allowed to live with his mother. She had to work on a different uh, property. So he lived for a time before going to the Y plantation with his grandparents in this cabin and that he remembers so fondly and so well with its um, floor where the sweet potatoes were kept uh, stored for the winter. And this um, image is uh, not from Maryland, but it's of uh, showing groups of a group of enslaved people on a plantation, getting the sweet potatoes ready, cutting them up, getting them ready to plant in the field. Um, I also found a um, diary entry by a woman, uh, a slaveholder named Martha Ogle Foreman, who was married to um, a, a man who owned, he was known as Captain Foreman, from Cecil County who owned the plantation called Rose Hill. And throughout her marriage from 1814 to 1845, she kept a journal, which she wrote in almost every day. And for her November 3rd, 1823 uh, entry, she writes, this day divided the sweet potatoes with the people. And she euphemistically referred to her uh, enslaved uh, workers as the people. Um, my husband planted two bushels. There were 19 uh, barrels for the people, one barrel and a half for ourselves. Um, two bushels to Mrs. Dr. Vesey, some to Miss Cox, and some to Mrs. Ward, some to Mrs. Horsey, and some to the Colonel Sewell, and we have been using them all the fall. So this um, collective uh, effort to plant sweet potatoes to share um, shows the importance of it. Um, and also, uh, when reading the memoir of uh, one of Maryland's um, former enslaved uh, men named Charles Ball, who escaped from slavery, he has a very long and interesting story. You can read it all about him in his memoir from 1837. Um, but his grandfather was brought to Maryland from Africa in 1730 and um, was brought to Calvert County. 
And uh, Ball himself was born in 1781. So he was born into slavery. Um, upon, in 1785, upon the death of his and his father's slaveholder, um, he and his father were both sold to Jack Cox of Calvert County, who uh, unfortunately the, their mother and siblings were all sold off individually, never seen again. But he writes uh, about uh, his father, my father never recovered from the effects of the shock which this sudden and overwhelming ruin of his family gave him. He had formerly been of a gay social temper, and when he came to see us on a Saturday night, he always brought us some little presents, such as the means of a poor slave would allow, apples, melons, sweet potatoes, or if he could procure nothing else, a little parched corn, which tasted better in our cabin because he had brought it. So little offerings of food, again, including sweet potatoes, uh, but this more, um, you know, sobering uh, fact is that the poor father never recovered from having his wife and, um, you know, other children sold away from him. So food can be more than just about, or the food stories are more than just about the food. Um, I also want to talk a little bit about the Pennsylvania Dutch. They arrived in Maryland in the late 17th century, uh, but by the middle of the 19th century, Pennsylvania Dutch people constituted one of the largest ethnic immigrant groups into Maryland. Um, they came primarily from certain regions of Germany, the Palatinate, um, for the most part in the Rhine, um, from, also from Switzerland, alsace lorraine -Lon, and the Netherlands. Um, many settled in the Frederick and Hagerstown areas, um, but also um, others settled in Baltimore. And most were of the Lutheran or Reformed faiths, although there were a few who were actually Jewish. Um, so, you know, it was a, a, again, a very interesting group. And they had a very uh, lasting impact on the regional food culture in Maryland. Um, and one of the things that they, uh, and, and perhaps Polish immigrants as well, have contributed to the traditions in Baltimore is the eating of sauerkraut with turkey on Thanksgiving Day. Um, so when you think about it, um, Thanksgiving became a national, not a legal, but a national holiday in 1863. And at that time, one fourth of all of Baltimore's population was German. Um, so it's really not surprising that um, a German dish, sauerkraut, would be included on that very American um, holiday as a sort of a reminder of where these people came from. And um, here's a, a submission, and, and I got another one today too for Maryland sauerkraut, which was funny because the woman's today is like, I have no idea why we eat sauerkraut. Um, so, you know, this hopefully will be an education for her. Um, but this woman, Rosemary Monin of Baltimore writes, I don't know much about the origin of this recipe, but it's a favorite in my house and a staple at every Thanksgiving and Christmas. And I'm not gonna go reading the rest of it just for the sake of time, but again, uh, very important. Um, also found another recipe, a German origin of sugar cookies, which is a link right back to um, this woman, Susan Gutierrez's grandmother, who was from Germany and um, brought this recipe with her to Maryland. Um, but we're also, I would like to end on uh, the fact that we are seeking new foods for a new generation. Um, in late 19th century, there were uh, immigrants coming from Greece, Italy, um, uh, also Germany again, uh, this time many more Jewish as well as Catholic, uh, Russians and Polish, um, who were also, again, many uh, Jewish, uh, Russia, Eastern Europeans. Uh, but more recent years, we've seen uh, influxes of people from uh, Hispanic uh, countries, which have you know, made a fantastic influence on the foods we eat here. Um, not African-Americans, but Africans coming directly from places like Ethiopia, Nigeria, et cetera, Asian people and other Eastern Europeans like Lithuanians. And there are new traditions from Marylanders who've been here for a long time, um, but maybe they have discovered some new traditions that um, they've put into their repertoire. Um, just again to end here. So a, a woman named Janet Medina from Montgomery County talks about her uh, family's tradition uh, from Venezuela of serving hayacas, um, which is like a tamale for Christmas in her household. Um, this uh, other submission by uh, Jenny Shiagal of um, making her uh, Hunan steamed sea bass here in Maryland. And this woman who actually is from India, but didn't learn how to 
cook until she moved to America and her uh, husband decided he wanted her to make all these wonderful um, foods from her homeland. Um, so she then had to like ask her mother how to cook Indian food in Maryland, uh, having never done it herself in India. So again, really interesting stories. We are seeking new traditions, um, seeking old traditions, seeking all sorts of information. Um, you know, so do you adapt uh, recipes to fit within a Maryland framework? Um, do you have family traditions that go back centuries that you'd like to keep preserved? Um, we're looking for all of these um, traditions. Please, please go to MarylandRecipes.org and um, submit your recipes, as many as you like, um, through that website portal, and um, I will be thrilled to get them. Um, so that is the end of my presentation. So I'm going to stop sharing and um, turn it over to Sophia. Wonderful. You already beat one of our questions, which was about um, submissions, but um, thank you so much. Thank you so much for your presentation. Um, we had someone ask, um, where do submissions get posted? And um, how are those able to be viewed by like general populace? Yeah, so that's part of uh, what we're working on right now. Um, we have very little fund, actually no funding, and it's essentially just me and a uh, volunteer. So uh, we're working on putting everything together. I have uh, the first batch that are ready to go to the Maryland State Archives, just have to get there and do it. Um, definitely by the fall, we'll have a lot of these submissions at the archives. Um, occasionally on the website or on the Facebook page, I may put uh, something that I find interesting. Um, so you just have to kind of pay attention to that. Uh, again, if, if anybody's looking for a volunteer job and wants to help, uh, you know, we're more than happy to, to uh, entertain that. Um, it's just a matter of logistics and getting it all on there, but it will be available um, sooner rather than later. Awesome. Um, we had someone ask, uh, uh, do you see a lack of recipes from a particular region in the state? Yeah. So uh, most of the recipes we're getting are from the, the Baltimore, Southern Maryland, Eastern Shore area. I would love to see more from like Frederick, Hagerstown, uh, Garrett County. Like I'd love to see more Pennsylvania Dutch. I would absolutely love to see Hispanic recipes, Ethiopian recipes, like I said before, um, you know, we, we, we have these pockets of um, tradition or, or cultures that settled in certain parts of the state, uh, really underrepresented, underrepresented in a culinary perspective, but probably in others as well. So it'd be nice to, to have that representation uh, marked for the early 21st century to see what those traditions were here, right? Because it's just might not, it might just look like food on paper, but that tells us so much more about immigration practices and, yeah. um, you know, and society at the time. Yeah. So, yeah. So definitely further West <laughs> would be, would be great. So anyone who lives in Western Maryland submits. Yeah. <laughs> um, we have another question. Have you received recipes from Maryland chefs like Nancy Longo or Cindy Wolf? No, I have, well, not from them, but I have received um, recipes from uh, the, the uh, um, I'm going to forget their name, uh, Claudia Kosoulis, and I'm going to forget her partner's name. They wrote a cookbook on Montgomery County foods, and they've been very supportive and have, every once in a while, you know, she'll send me recipes. She sent me a uh, Sandy Spring uh, post office bread, which is, you know, it's this story behind that and you know so she did a squash buns and actually a reporter uh, who was looking to write about the recipe hunt uh, wanted to film somebody cooking a recipe and so I pointed her in in Claudia's direction so there's a video out there on um, her making the sweet potato buns awesome okay so I don't remember where you'd find that but you can always contact me through the website and then I can send you that link. And actually, I think I put it on the, the website, on the rest, on the uh, video section. Perfect. Um, we have one question left, but again, everyone joining us, if you have a question uh, that hasn't been answered, please post in the comments. Um, so we have someone who asks, um, 
Have you made any of the recipes that have been submitted? Is that something that you even do? So I have been, because I've been working on the Maryland's Way companion book, I've been making more of those recipes because I'm including modern recipe adaptations for them. But there's a long list of recipes that I want to try. <laughs> so, um, and that will be happening too. Um, one of my uh, volunteers who's helping test recipes for the book, um, she's a, she works in uh, history education in Howard County, but lucky for me, she is a trained chef from the Culinary Institute as well. So I'm hoping to get her to test some of those recipes as well. Perfect. Yeah. Um, ah, we got a question. Where can, where can I buy the cookbook? I think that might've been in reference to the one you just mentioned, but are yeah, you that, the cookbook that has not been finished yet. Um, yeah. So that'll be in 2024. It will, well, we're working on that. So it will probably, well, it will definitely be available through uh, Hammond Harwood House gift shop, but we're hoping to make it available statewide through different historic sites in their gift shops. And it may be in different bookstores and it should be on Amazon too at that point. You know, you should be, you should be able to order it um, or, and perhaps order a digital version of it. So we're working, we're actually, we're, I have a meeting about that next week. So we're working on all of that. But it will be readily available when it does come out. Yes. <laughs> awesome. Um, so I don't see any other questions. So I guess my last question will be what is the best what what is the best way someone can contact you if they have any questions or um would like to learn more? Yeah, so you can go to the website, MarylandRecipes.org, and there's a contact uh, like widget there, you know, there like pops up. It says if you want to ask a question, there's um, also it's just through the recipe submission page or the contact page. Um, so there's multiple ways you can that will go right to me. Yeah. Awesome. Oh, we have one. We have one sneaky question that has slipped in. Um, is the 1963 edition still in print? Um, it is not. We we the book itself is still in print. Um, it's been you know, gone through different iterations. It's essentially the same, but it's just, you know, a nicer, newer cover. Um, but if you go on eBay, you can find, you can generally find at least the 66 edition. Um, and every once in a while, you'll see a 63 edition. Ooh, okay. Yeah. But the, I mean, it really hasn't changed. Kind of like textbooks. They don't yeah, there just might be like an introduction by somebody. Else. You know, it's, it really hasn't, the recipes themselves haven't changed. Awesome. Well, Thank you, Joyce, so much for oh, presenting today, telling us about the great recipe hunt and how we could like reach out and learn more and share. Please, if you, if anyone watching has recipes they like to share, please submit. I've put the link in the um, comments, so it's right there. And um, one more thing, um, to make it easier for you, if you have recipes that are written down in like Word documents um, and images, you can also attach them. So you can just write in the box, oh, see attachment, whatever. And that makes it easier, so you don't have to type it into the box so. even better so that yeah. means <laughs> attach a picture and then everyone's good to go right um i want to thank our partners at the maryland state archives and the maryland four centuries project um thank our wonderful asl interpreters today for providing accessibility and last but not least i would like to thank our audience for joining us this afternoon um uh, everyone stay safe take care and have a great rest of your afternoon <laughs>